Evolution FM. Uplift yourself to uplift others. It's time to evolve. Hey, beautiful humans. Today we have a, another great episode with Joe Allen. I first discovered Joe on Substack through his publication, Singularity Weekly, which Joe talks a lot about this whole transhumanism movement, amongst other cultural ideas. And I have to say, I had no idea about lots of things that were going on in the world of merging the human consciousness with machine consciousness. Now, I definitely don't think that I am a fan of that in any regard, but it is certainly something that I wanted to just understand because it seems like the more and more I educate myself, the more that this is something that is going to become a part of culture in one form or another in the coming decades. And so I wanted to have Joe on the show to discuss this topic, to bring awareness to these different ideas and themes so that all of us, as we go on our own journey, can really understand why this is happening. And what I didn't anticipate from this conversation, but I did learn was that the core desire of a lot of these people that are driving this is actually quite similar to the core desire of a lot of people that find themselves on the spiritual path. However, the means and the ways which we're both trying to go about achieving higher levels of wisdom and freedom and autonomy are quite different. And in this understanding, I personally think that I was able to just have more empathy and also more compassion for a group of people that are driving a lot of change in the world that frankly, I can't say that I particularly support. All right, enough intro. Let's get on with the episode and hear from Joe. Hey, Joe, how's it going? Good, Scott. How are you? Good. It's great to have you on the show. And I'm so glad that I stumbled upon your writing. I mentioned this in the intro, but you have a fantastic Substack called Singularity Weekly. I know that you write some other places, but what I found so compelling to learn from you about was everything that is going on in the world of transhumanism. And maybe just to kind of start things off for the audience that perhaps isn't as in depth with this, could you define transhumanism in the current context of our culture? Yeah, very simply, transhumanism is the goal to merge human beings with machines. And that occurs on various levels from the brain to the body to the wider culture. And, you know, transhumanism, the, the root of it is transitional human. And also the transcendent human is another way of thinking of the trans and transhumanism. But the goal ultimately is to transcend our biological and psychological limitations to take hold of evolution and direct it by human hands towards preferred goals. And it's really become a much more popular term in the last few years, mainly in the wake of the pandemic, and especially on the right, especially among those who are very resistant to it. But real quickly, I, I, I think that the term transhumanism, you know, as it's attached to a very specific school of thought, a very specific circle of thinkers uh, who are in many ways being supplanted by new thinkers in that vein, I think the term transhumanism might have already reached its shelf life. I may be the last transhumanism editor for the war room ever. They'll have to call it something else when I go. And there are a lot of different names that you, you hear being bandied around. I didn't, none of them have the same flavor that transhumanism does, but uh, you know, terms like biodigital convergence, you know, another that's come into the news quite recently, and it comes out of the transhumanist movement, effective altruism and long-termism, optimalism, as in optimizing your capacities. All of these sorts of things are also really, in essence, transhumanism. So that's the basic definition. And, uh, you know, I think that that explosion of awareness on the right 
has done two things. One, it, it really has brought a lot of these guys out of the shadows. Like a lot of them, I think, crave the attention they're getting, even if it's negative. They had a lot of it back in the 90s. Uh, there was another burst in the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, now it's really come back to the forefront, largely through the World Economic Forum, I think. Why now are are these people coming forth and so excited about it when previously they might have been in the shadows? I think there's two different elements, maybe three. The first major element uh, that I just mentioned a minute ago, more attention. The second, though, is that technology really is ramping up. We really are reaching a convergence of all these different technologies where they're feeding off of each other. A sort of platform has been formed for various new technologies to launch from. So, you know, the main things that I focus on are artificial intelligence, robotics, brain-computer interfacing, and also genetic engineering, or just any sort of phenotypic engineering as well. And all of these different realms have seen tremendous progress that are really coming to fruition right now. And I think that's one reason that transhumanism as a topic is coming up, because people will see these advances that were predicted by transhumanists uh, that have been desired by transhumanists. And it, it does look like something like the many various transhumanist visions is coming to the pass. Uh, it does look like we're on the upward curve of that exponential accelerating progress that someone like Ray Kurzweil or someone like Ben Goetzel uh, has long predicted and looked forward to. Artificial intelligence is really key to this because artificial intelligence is driving all of the others. You know, the genetic engineering advances that we've seen, uh, you know, in CRISPR has been largely made possible by artificial intelligence. And when you look at brain computer interfacing, you know, artificial intelligence makes a big difference in mapping the brain and its functions, but also the justification from someone like Elon Musk for even creating a very complex and commercially available brain computer interface. The reasoning is that artificial intelligence is becoming so advanced that it will require some sort of link, a neural link, in order for a paltry human mind to keep up with what that computer system is doing. Then robotics, that's very obvious. And the integration of artificial intelligence into robotics so that a robot is no longer just a programmed being but a being that in, in the sense that artificial intelligence learns, it's a learning being, it's a kind of window into physical reality for the robot. And then our, you know, AI itself has seen huge leaps forward in the last few years. Uh, and you know, last year, I, you know, since I've been tracking it for the war room with Steve Bannon, I track as much as I can possibly take in. And it's pretty astounding. I mean, some of it may be, uh, you know, selection bias just because I've spent so much time in the last two years on it that maybe I perceive an increase where it's been a steady, you know, a dramatic increase where it's been a steady increase before. But of course, I've gone back and, you know, tried to check myself to make sure. I mean, I've, I have followed this for some 20 years, just not with the intensity that I have in the last two. But artificial intelligence has made tremendous strides, tremendous strides in the last few years. And uh, some of it is technique. Uh, some of it, I, I think, is hardware. Most of it, I think, though, is software technique, programming technique, the way that deep learning systems are, or, are organized. And, uh, and also, I, I'm sure to some degree, the uh, open source software that's allowed so many different people to work on it has probably made a huge difference as well. Yeah, no question. I mean, I haven't been following it to the degree that you have, but having worked in the software and our company was an AI company in some regards, much more rudimentary than what we're talking about now, this stuff has been on my radar. And, you know, personally, I'm much more on the like, I want to be more in touch with the natural way, you know, living in nature, living with the laws of life that humans have always had. But I think it's just important to be aware of what's going on because my perception is, is there's seemingly a continuum that is occurring where these technologies and ways of being, I've, I've heard you talk about this in other interviews where there's 
kind of this initial concept of healing where maybe perhaps somebody that is incapacitated for the first time can express what's happening in their consciousness on Twitter, for example, or by simply thinking something into typing. But then there's this continuum to enhancement where many of these people want to use this to essentially avoid dying and many other things. And it would just be really great to just hear your perspective on that continuum and what we maybe as perhaps people that are just normal people that haven't been really interfacing with this whole revolution, what we should be aware of. The first thing I would say about that is something I've tried to emphasize from the very, very beginning of covering this is that transhumanism and techno fetishism in general and the scientism that sits underneath it, the idea that science will solve all of our existential problems, all of our moral problems. This is a religious movement. It's not a religious movement in the sense that you have one sort of charismatic cult leader or a group of ordained cult leaders, although it does function somewhat like that to an extent. It's a very heterodox religious movement at the moment, mainly because I think it's in an early phase. And it doesn't have the same sorts of ritualistic trappings as many previous religious movements. But it is a religious movement in the sense that it sketches or, you know, it, it really paints a very detailed picture of what the cosmos is and our place in it. And it lays out the problem of evil, the evil being the negative side of our evolutionary inheritance and the limitations of being human beings and particularly being mortal human beings will all die. And so it offers a solution, a salvation, and the solutions are, I think, much more various than the problem and the cosmos, right? Like the salvation principle is very, very different from thinker to thinker. Ray Kurzweil has pretty different ideas than uh, Elon Musk. There's a lot of overlap, but they're, they're very different ideas. And that, that extends out to people like Max Tegmark uh, at MIT or Nick Bostrom or uh, Anders Sandberg at Oxford, on and on and on, right? Like all of these dif different people, they're, they're, very, they're coming at it from different approaches. But in every case, the, the idea is that technology will solve all of these age-old problems that religion has sought to solve. Now, traditional religion places salvation in some sort of transcendent realm, and that's true pretty much across the board. There's different ways that different religions are interpreted so that you could say that, you know, among some Buddhists, they would say, like Zen Buddhists in particular, that the salvation is here, that Nirvana is here, Satori is here, you're already in enlightenment. And so it's not necessarily transcendent. But I think you're splitting hairs at that point. In general, religion is placing salvation somewhere outside of this physical material realm. And transhumanism basically puts forward all of these different possibilities as to how technology can take over those tasks, grant us immortality, grant us some sort of approximation of omniscience, grant us an, an approximation of omnipotence. And then in the kind of post-human realm, where they talk about the creation of artificial intelligence systems that are so far past human abilities, and the various mechanical systems that can manipulate the world extending out from it, robots, nanobots, so on and so forth. They're talking about the creation of God, and in the creation of God lies salvation in eternity or some approximation of eternity. And so that's the first thing, I think, really, to get the worldview behind all of this. It's the, the idea that it's most extremes is that God will be created and our salvation lies in our ability to merge ourselves with that God. This is so interesting to me because as someone who's fervently pursued what many call enlightenment, which is the self-realization or God-realization of self as the identity shifts away from the ego, which can still be done inside the container of a human body, it's really fascinating that at the end of the day, 
these people are trying to achieve the same thing, but just through a different mechanism Yeah. than a lot of these ancient wisdom traditions. Like that's really just fundamentally what it comes down to. And, you know, there's a mixture, right? So, you know, many people accuse Christians or um, those Jewish traditions that hold to an, a, an afterlife or Islam, which holds to an afterlife. Uh, and really, you know, Hinduism and Buddhism, too, have elements of this, uh, as do Chinese religions. But anyway, the accusation oftentimes is it's the height of egotism, that the desire to be preserved beyond your physical death is a function of the ego that is so intensely focused on itself, it will not let go of its temporary nature and has to be kept forever in some sort of heaven or near God or, or however that's conceived. But... On the other hand, uh, you, you've got you know the, the sort of dissolution processes that are put forward in various religious traditions, including Christianity to some extent. But the idea that you should destroy the ego and allow the divine to course through you and to become a vessel for the divine, uh, or in the case of Buddhism, to become a vessel for Buddha nature. What's interesting about transhumanism, like I say, there are so many different ways to approach it that people have approached it. But you find both, right? So you find this desire to maintain the personal ego in a digital state pretty much forever, as long as you can keep the power on, right? And then you also have this idea, this sort of post-human idea, that you will create this hyper-intelligent artificial intelligence system or a swarm-like artificial intelligence systems uh, that, again, sweep past humanity. We are the stepping stones for them. What the real meaning of our being is, is beyond our imagination, because these things will evolve into forms that we just simply cannot conceive. They're just undulating clouds in our imagination, whereas in reality, they're, they're hyper-complex and full of bliss and joy, whatever, hatred, malice, whatever, everything, all at once. And in that form, there's a real lack of ego in it, right? There's this idea that human beings are nothing. Each individual human being is basically nothing. We are just you know, vessels for this artificial intelligence being that will be created. And uh, we should anticipate and be excited about and uh, you know, really feel, and as Arthur C. Clarke said back in 1964, that we should find it to be a privilege to be stepping stones for a creature or a being greater than ourselves. So it's interesting. You do have both. You have both the ego-driven and the egoless. Yeah. And that is interesting because if you identify as consciousness itself, which is all things and, and this concept that you are all things, then whether it's in human form or in some, you know, artificial intelligence form that we can't really conceive, it doesn't really matter. You know, they're all just emanations and expressions of, of a higher divinity. And better or worse than is, is just a concept rooted in, in, in the egoic self. And so that is fascinating. I was not aware that there are certain advocates of this movement that are thinking that way. Yeah. You know, Ray Kurzweil is an interesting blend of these. So he is obsessed with the digital afterlife. Uh, he has a, all of his father's belongings and, and memoirs, you know, his, his letters and mementos collected in the hopes of resurrecting his father. I, I think that his father's death was severely traumatic for him. He's coming to the end of his life now. Uh, I said, sorry, Ray, I'm pretty sure that's happening. There's a real sadness in seeing Ray Kurzweil get old in a way. Uh, you know, a lot of people hate him because he has a, such a megalomaniacal view of what the transhumanist future should be. And I, I, I must say, I detest his worldview as much as anybody. But there's something very sad about watching him cling to his, his self, his being, uh, even in his, his quick mind is, seems to be going. You have compassion for him. But he also, you know, he has a mixture, though, of this, this desire to be preserved forever in silico. But also in his idea of the singularity, it's really a letting go, right? Like, so the singularity, as he articulates it, and he takes this from uh, Werner Vinge, but the singularity is that moment, he predicts 2045-ish, at which technology artificial intelligence, robotics, nanotechnology, genetics, all of them have converged and accelerated to a point that they are no longer in human control, in any meaningful control. 
And uh, we really cannot, we can't see what's going to happen. There's no way to predict what happens after that, right? The possibilities are so wild. There's no way to predict it. And the idea, the, the singularitarian ideal is the person who, you know, the person just lets go of their need to know. They let go of their ego and just assume that if they build these systems correctly, they're benevolent enough, they'll keep us around. Basically, they'll keep us as pets. You know, we'll be merged to them like, uh, I guess, like in the in Nightmare on Elm Street where you have all those souls trapped inside of Freddy Krueger and their faces are pushing out on his skin. We'll be like that, only inside of the, the supercomputer god. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it's very, very interesting. I, I think that, uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, uh, what I consider transhumanism to be is an inversion of spiritual principles. Truth, man. Uh, I, I think that they, they desire to create what is ineffable on earth. I think that they desire to create that which, you know, to recreate those realms which are totally beyond mortal human comprehension on earth. And uh, it, it's one of the main differences, though. Uh, there are many, many, many differences. But one of the main differences is that God, the ground of being, like the source of everything that we are, however you want to conceive it, is self-propelled, self-sustaining. We are sustained by God. Whereas this machine they want to create, or this the system of machines they want to create, clearly is beholden to natural laws and, and, and the laws of entropy. Of course they dream of a, a machine that can over, overcome even natural laws and overcome the natural entropy of the universe, or maybe even halt the big crunch if that's the way the cosmos ends. But uh, yeah, it, it really is just this, this, to me, it's a deluded inversion of the, the deep spiritual principles that are taught in every world religion around the world. You know, that light which shines through the stained glass to varying degrees of clarity. And they basically just, they're, they're squashing that light out to put it in Christian terms, to create a sort of satanic mirror for God, an antichrist, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, even when I think about this concept of having access to infinite information in your consciousness, I mean, that ability is something that is basically a goal of Buddhism, of, of a lot of these wisdom practices. The mechanism is different. And so there's so many parallels. You know, I, I can't help but think about my own experience where I've had many experiences and much verification from a higher divinity that, you know, I, I've lived many lives and I will live many more. And if you believe that and you believe in the concept of you are God manifested as a human that doesn't know it and you're here to have all these experiences and do that over and over again on infinity, it just, there isn't really a whole lot of pressure to preserve the current state that all of these people, I guess, feel so compelled to try to create. You know, that idea, um, that idea that, that this mortal coil is temporary, uh, it really, I think, is one of the, the primary sources of revulsion. Aside from the sort of blasphemy of the idea of creating God, there's a real revulsion among Christians and you know, to some extent, Buddhists, I, you know, I, I've only spoken to really Western Buddhists about this. So, you know, I hate to speak for the, the, the Eastern Buddhist tradition in this sense. Hindus, I've spoken to Hindus who are equally repelled by the idea. Uh, and, and, you know, Muslims as well. Uh, it, it, for whatever reason, the Jewish tradition seems to be fairly at peace with it, although there are some who, who also find disgust in it. But anyway, that idea that that this physical world is temporary and that, you know, that sort of resignation that one wants to live as long a life and as fruitful a life as possible. But in the end, that life is taken from us and we're promised some new life on the other end of it. Uh, whereas, again, this, the transhumanist movement and all the, all the variants, whatever label you want to put on it, the transhumanist movement seeks to achieve all of that here, to basically trap the soul here in this material realm. And I, and I think that that is like the source of, of, of if nothing else, a sort of uh, a sense of uh, disturbance, right? The, the sense of unease with it that, uh, you know, religious people are trying their best to cultivate a mindset that lets go of all of these things and yeah. just allows the divine to move through us. It's just the total opposite, right? Where it's like one is trying to 
build up and enhance the self while the other is trying to let go of it. There's a point too that uh, I hate to make all these qualifications, but I, I would hate for your audience to go away thinking that all transhumanists are atheist materialists. That is the dominant philosophy driving it, undoubtedly, that most transhumanists and the most prominent transhumanists certainly are. But there are religious transhumanists. It's quite interesting. There are Mormon transhumanists. It's a small enclave, but they exist. Transhumanism fits into certain Mormon ideas that, you know, the soul, if you achieve a certain degree of purity or a, you know, alignment with the commandments, that you'll become a god in the celestial sphere. And so they just kind of adapt that to transhumanism. There are Christian transhumanists. Uh, I, if, I hope I have his name correct, but there's a guy, Lee Newton, uh, who wrote uh, or he, he compiled a series of essays on transhumanists by transhumanists, but he puts forward the argument for Christian transhumanists. And there are a few of those too. Jewish transhumanists, I don't know, but there are a lot of Jewish people who are transhumanists. That's interesting. Um, and, you know, so on and so forth. And really, I think one of the most interesting, Buddhist, right? So there is, um, I, I, it's not that some sort of like Theravada or Mahayana sect has adopted transhumanism, but guys like Ben Goetzel or um, artists like the Wachowski siblings that made The Matrix, uh, they incorporate Buddhism and Buddhist ideas into transhumanism. Oh my God. Yeah. Red pill, blue pill. It's like, okay, this is pretty much, are you awake? Are you conscious or unconscious? Yeah. And, and the Wachowski siblings, uh, you know, I, I guess they have a real negative view in some sense of what transhumanist futures would look like. But, uh, you know, in the end, uh, yeah, I kind of hated the second two movies, but in the end there is this, um, a, a reunification of the human soul with the machine soul, if you, you recall. So, you know, I guess ultimately they're rooting for a positive end to all this. And God knows that, you know, the transgender connection to transhumanism is very evident in the Wachowski siblings. Yeah, anyway, just to lay that out there, that while you know atheist materialism and scientism really forms the foundation of transhumanism, there are religious transhumanists out there. Yeah. And look, I, I do think there are very positive things that can come out of the infancy of these technologies by giving people that, you know, frankly, have a very limited life experience, one that's much more expansive and, you know, people being able to interact with family members that maybe they weren't able to before, things like that. But the self-preservation tendency that, you know, lots of leaders in this regime have, it seems like it's just, it's a slope that cannot be controlled. Once we go this direction and to the degree that we have, it, it just doesn't seem like people can practice any type of uh, stopping. You know, I think the, the big danger in all of this, or the most immediate danger in all of this, I should say, is not necessarily that they will create an artificial super intelligence that begins to convert everything into gray goo or computronium or whatever and just, you know, eats us all, uh, nor that they will create robots to destroy us just because, you know, it was programmed in, in properly. Uh, and, and really, I think that a lot of people probably get pretty messed up by a lot of these genetic uh, experiments that are required in order to extend life. But I don't think that's the, the major concern either. My biggest concern when it comes to transhumanism is that the ideas themselves are very seductive, especially in a pretty atheistic, pretty unspiritual culture like America or Europe uh, or many parts of Asia. And I think that that seduction makes technology seem amenable to human values, human desires, and the human being, like all of the needs of the human being. And, and that, that, you know, that somehow you'll be able to accommodate the good in yourself to this tremendous power in this technology, which is inherently transformative. Even if it's not transforming you into some kind of mini demigod, it's definitely transforming us. Just this, the process that we're in right now of speaking across great distances, all of that has already transformed us profoundly. But what I see uh, really is the the specter of technocratic control riding behind this so that 
as people become enamored with the idea that artificial intelligence can make great decisions in your life or give you tremendous insight, as people are enamored with the idea of robots of any sort, whether they be really primitive robots or some sort of super complex robot like, like Sophia or Amica, these new uh, advanced robots, uh, and, and it, you know, or even like holding out the ideal of a brain computer interface, right? Like it, you don't need the brain computer interface in order to seduce people with the ideal so that all the other things, all the sort of smartphone addiction or the use of like next level non-invasive brain computer interfaces or just sitting around screwing your life away playing video games, all of these things then become acceptable in light of these extreme views. And in all of these cases, and then, and then add in the, the physical element, right, the biological element, the, the, the extreme power and seduction of the pharmaceutical industry um, and the biomedical state as a whole, all of these things are, are being wielded, as, as far as I can tell, they're being wielded quite skillfully by powers that want little more than power. And so these ideals become these sorts of illusions, these, these temptations into the rat trap that is, could possibly be an inescapable technocracy. It might be fluid at the top, but from the perspective of normal citizens, of normal people, what you're talking about is a technological system that keeps you basically in a sort of little mini matrix and, you know, it wields control over you in every aspect of your life and keeps you under constant surveillance and it regulates, monitors and regulates as many facets of your being as it possibly can. And always, always, always for your own good. So that's to me, and a lot of transhumanists, by the way, a lot of transhumanists, I would say most transhumanists, don't put that forward as the ideal. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about morphological freedom and the ability to self-realize and all these things. The people I see in power, the various governmental and corporate structures I see in power, what they seem to want primarily is power. Yeah, and control, which is power. I think, you know, it's interesting to think about just as a, to give an example of this is, you know, something as simple as our phones where there's probably places that right now we're kind of in an evolution of like, well, cash isn't really accepted. And, and then there's things like you pay with your phone and then maybe soon there will get rid of cards and you can only pay with your phone. And then there's going to be people with chips in their hands and they're paying with their chips in their hands. And then there's going to be a time where it's like, oh, you don't have a chip in your hand. You can't buy this. You're probably aware there already are a lot of people with chips in their hands now. No, I, I heard that in your other interview about mm. people using getting their credit card put into their hand. Like, what the yeah. fuck? It's just crazy. Those also, by the way, um, that hinges on, again, transhumanist sort of ideals. A lot of these biohackers, they are either transhumanists or transhumanist adjacent. But the alarm that's being sounded by everyone who is opposing the institution of central bank digital currencies or a transition to an entirely digital monetary system. Uh, you know, everybody sounding the alarm says the same thing because it's the truth that you cannot get around. Then you have a system that can monitor every transaction and can shut off your ability to buy or sell. It's crazy. And so the idea of merging your body with technology to the point that you're going to put an RFID chip in your hand willingly for convenience or for some weird spiritual sense of merging with the machine. It's beyond me, that desire. But then again, you know, I've been to S&M clubs and I've always found it very curious why anyone would do that too. So I guess, uh, you know, it takes all kinds, but I would hate to see this worldview <laughs> spread much further. I, I, I see it as a kind of cancerous ideology and it's one that is spreading first on waves of kind of a like groovy propaganda, like what the metaverse tried to do. But, you know, I think video gaming, I think gaming is, you know, I don't play video games, but I'm around some young men who do. And I think gaming as a sort of means of normalizing this constant state of digital awareness and digital worldview, I think it's going a long way to create little proto-transhumanists that don't realize that that's what they are. The same with social media and females, by the way. I mean, not that men don't become very attached to their social media identity as well, but I think females in this, this sort of 
uh, you know, the, 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 this digital mirror that they hold up in front of themselves to make themselves more beautiful and appealing. And they become obsessed with this other person that is their digital self, their digital twin. I think these very kind of mundane things that are taken as normal now, even though they really didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago, and not to the degree of vividness and intensity they do now. But I think these mundane things really are like this, these stepping stones towards, again, I don't even know if it's possible to jack somebody's brain into the internet. I mean, looking at the technology as it is right now, this this idea that you're going to be in, they're going to plug people into the matrix in the next five to 10 years seems very ridiculous to me. But uh, what you can do is you can sit people, you can plop them in front of a screen and you can keep them there for most of their lives and you can cultivate their values through that screen. You can do that real easy. They're, they've been doing that since long before you or I were born and it, they're only getting better at it and there are only more and more screens. So yeah, again, that's, that's really my concern. My concern is the, all of the different forces who are seizing all of these technologies that are advancing in front of us and whatever positive that can come out of it. And there are plenty of positives. I think most of that is outweighed by a, the powers that will wield them and b the sort of distractions that they really do create that draw us away from what is most important in our lives. No, I, I, I agree. And it's the tough thing about all of this stuff. You know, I'm just thinking about, all the Bitcoin maximalists who talk about, you know, freeing people from certain governments and societies where, you know, their money isn't worth anything. And it's just, there's, there's always another side and there's always an edge and it's really, really tough. One thing I heard you say that I thought was really interesting was that the, this movement is being driven by basically by culture kings. You know, that's kind of like the Elon Musk's, the Bill Gates, the Peter Thiel's. Joe Rogan. Let's not forget our boy, Joe Rogan. I mean, look, I know a lot of people that listen to this love Joe Rogan. Like, can you talk about the way in which these people either consciously or unconsciously are the ones that are essentially fueling the fire here? You know, uh, Joe Rogan is a really good example because I think Joe Rogan, you know, some time ago, maybe a year ago, I saw Joe Rogan listed as a transhumanist on Wikipedia. And I thought that was pretty ridiculous because uh, and that's just sim simply not how I see him. But <laughs> because Joe Rogan is, he is a person who is always kind of flitting from one idea to another. Uh, he's just exploring, he's constantly exploring ideas, right? A lot of people complain he doesn't really hit his guests hard enough that he just allows his guests to just say whatever without checking them. But I think that's the reason that people like Joe Rogan, right? Because he becomes a kind of vessel, even though he's an arrogant kind of talky, you know, trash talking dude himself. Uh, he is really, he's able to make himself a vessel for all these other ideas and people. You know, he's had Ben Gertzel on, for instance. And I remember watching that interview with such interest because you've got Ben Gertzel basically talking about, the extinction of the human race at the hands of advanced technological systems or entities at this point, basically in sold entities is how they're conceiving of it at this point. And that we're just like the dinosaurs and, you know, that we're, we just have to let go. Right. Uh, it's evolution. Right. And Joe Rogan is like, yeah, yeah. You know, scary, scary, but yeah. Then I've also heard Joe Rogan talk about just on his, of his own accord, like that, you know, we're just kind of these evolutionary stepping stones uh, nobody is going to be able to resist the, the allure of Neuralink, so on and so forth. Um, he wasn't really, he was a little disturbed when he interviewed Elon Musk those two times, but he didn't, it's not like he pushed back. So I think Joe Rogan really has created a platform for these ideas, uh, making them seem, uh, you know, at least plausible, uh, acceptable. You know, of course you want like Joe Rogan to be on Team Human because you want Joe Rogan to be your bro. Right. But um, you can't really ask that. of I mean, he just is who he is. He, you know, the psychedelic element, the UFO element, uh, you know, whatever, the, the in bomb element. If you don't like any of those things, you know, that's just part of who Joe Rogan is. And so the transhumanist element is, too. And I think, you know, I think that it, there's a naivety to it, especially now with this Elon Musk fanboyism. There's a super intense naivety to that. 
because what they're talking about, what these transhumanists, the ideal they're laying out, what they're talking about isn't evolution in the traditional sense, right? They're not talking about even the, the slow advance of Homo sapiens into Europe, you know, slowly killing off Neanderthals over the course of generations. This isn't like, uh, you know, your rats slowly but surely becoming dogs. This is meteorite slamming into the earth and destroying all that came before and replacing it with something else, something new. And so, uh, you know, any culture that has adopted that as an ideal, any culture that has adopted the, the notion that your children and your children's children are basically these kind of empty vessels for machines to grow out of, right? Like these machines sort of like parasitic wasps laying their eggs in us. And we're just these, you know, zombie caterpillars squirming around waiting for what is truly supposed to happen to happen, which is like new parasitic wasps being born out of us. Um, Like any culture that is a dying culture, that is a decadent culture, that is not a culture that's going to make it. Unless the machines take over for us, we're we're not going to make it. Joe Rogan is a paradoxical example because he's a very disciplined person. He's a, you know, a very assertive person. It's not like he's just sitting around smoking herb and letting his life waste away while you know, the machines take over. It's not like that. But I, I do think that there is this tremendous naivety in him. I think that the people who idolize Elon Musk as some sort of savior are just fooling themselves. If he's serious at all about the philosophy that he adheres to, uh, I think that even Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel is like somewhere in this weird gray zone where Peter Thiel is ultimately philosophically, and, and, and Peter Thiel has gone a long way to articulate his own personal philosophy, much more so than many of these other characters. You know, he philosophically is very pro-human, right? But like the, he doesn't necessarily believe that artificial general intelligence is around the corner. And he doesn't necessarily believe that the machines should be these entities to submit to. Uh, He basically argues that the machines should be the vehicle for Western kind of Judeo-Christian culture to flourish through. And to some extent to, you know, reassert our imperial dominance seems to be the subtext, Uh, which I'm not really into either. But so to answer your question in a sentence, I think all of these people are offering in their own way a window into a transhumanist future, and they have the power to push it forward. Yeah, I mean, it's more or less exposure is what we're talking about here to wide audiences. And it's interesting as as a creator, it's something that you often don't think about, which are the implications of when you have a show like this show or any show or whatever you're creating, the idea is that you're putting in front of people. And when you involve other people that are beyond yourself, you might not have complete control of those. Right. It's a fascinating thing to think about. You seem like you are obviously quite dialed into this. What are the steps that you take in your personal life to be pro-human and remain true to, you know, what you believe is a I don't even know the right experience for how you want to live your life. You know, the three things that I do to anchor myself, uh, I'm not nearly as diligent about this as I should be. Um, Become better and better at it. What you have to understand is nearly two years ago, Steve Bannon reached out to me and turned me into a cyborg. Uh, He asked me to cover transhumanism on the war room. In order to do that, I've had to fuse to various devices that are all sitting in front of me right now. And so uh, it's been very challenging. You know, before that, I was living a pretty low-tech life and a quite happy life. What I do, though, uh, the, the three things that I would say are the most important to me. One, spending time in nature as much as possible. Uh, I lived in Montana uh, for about two years. I'm now uh, somewhere else uh, in the southeast And as much as I can, I spend time in nature and just try to absorb just the aesthetic of it, obviously, but also just to keep contemplating those the processes that underpin all of our lives, right? Then the natural processes, flow of the water, the the place of the the soil, the place of the trees, the animals, the, you know, the benevolence, the predation, the violence of it, all of it, right? Um, Second, you know, as much as I can, and I don't do this near enough, I'll tell you that right now. 
keep my devices put away, not just turned off or set aside, put them like, like I'm hiding them in cages, right? Like I'm putting them back in cages and locking them away. The more I do that, the better I feel. And the more that I read books and literature and, you know, in any human interaction, this is just an aside, but in any human interaction, anytime you're at a party or out with friends or with family for the love of God, any digital device that forms a distraction uh, just has to be banned. I can be very annoying in that way, as you could imagine. And lastly, you know, I, I, I've always sought out different religious institutions I've studied religion all of my adult life, back into my, my mid-teens, actually. And I've spent a lot of time in different temples and houses of worship, synagogues, mosques, so on and so forth. And while I don't really identify with any of them as a member, something about that rhythm and the kind of society, sort of the same way that nature uh, forms, something about that rhythm, something about being a part, a witness to, and to some extent a part of those ancient sacred rituals in those houses that are built on a structure, an ancient structure, right? Not the soil, just the design itself, right? The, the, the iconography and so forth, the ritual itself. That also, I think, keeps me pretty well rooted. But to be honest, Scott, uh, this, this cyborg existence that I live, is, you know, the machine is creeping in fast. Uh, I haven't taken the jab, but if, you know, I feel like I have nanobots coursing through me anyway. Maybe it's coming out of the chemtrails, huh? Yeah, man. I mean, look, I think... All the things that you just said are resonate immensely with me. You know, I live in Austin, Texas right now. And I actually, through a lot of this spiritual work, have become very sensitive to a lot of uh, EMFs, like a lot of electricity, a lot of Wi Fi. Like I, I feel my nervous system shift when I'm in nature versus in an urban area, which I live now. And, um, yeah, I, I mean the, the kind of more remote existence where you're in nature a lot and your phones doesn't need to be on you all the times and you're in the moment when when you're with people you're actually with them. I mean, all of that to me is kind of almost like a we left that and now I want to come back to it. And I admire you for you know just the steps that you're taking in your own life. You know, I don't want to overplay it, dude. Uh, you know, I do what I can. I, I, I look forward to the day when maybe I can do something like what I'm doing in a more analog form. But yeah, as, as it is right now, let's just say that, uh, again, I don't need nanobots coursing through my bloodstream. I've got these screens. They're good enough for me. They reach deep into the soul. You're probably familiar with the entire conspiracy theory around the, the nanobots and the jab, right? I haven't gone deep down that rat hole, but high level idea, yes. I've had to waste a lot of time on it because obviously if there's anything to it at all, it's something that I would be remiss to just ignore, right? I've spent an awful lot of time down that rabbit hole. And I, I, I think um, it's interesting because I think they've identified a lot of the technologies that people want, you know, everyone from DARPA to, uh, you know, the Ray Kurzweil's of the world, they want to exist. Uh, but I don't, you know, anyway, I think it's all a bunch of hooey. But what I do think is that uh, it's just wild to me. Like, I just imagine these people, like, obsessively glued to their screens and freaking out about nanobots. Like, they're going to turn on the 5G and control people's minds with the nanobots. While they're, you know, be basically having their minds controlled by these kind of high-level <laughs> manipulators and grifters uh, in a way that's far more profound than anything 5G is going to do to some nanobot-saturated victim. Uh, anyway, it's just, it's, it's, it's funny to me darkly. I think the, unfortunately, uh, the media and its ability to inspire fear in people and that fear take a grip and control people's consciousness is, is a huge unseen threat that a lot of people can't perceive until, until you can. And so I just wish for everyone that they can continue to expand their awareness so that they have just more personal freedom, both in terms of you know, what they actually do in their life, but how they feel moment to moment, because that's really what it's all about. I know that you had, uh, you know, we mentioned before uh, the interview, psychedelics and their role, technology and, and the entire transhumanist movement, the, the religious life, something about psychedelics that really intrigues me. And uh, it's reported again and again in the literature. Let's just say that I also have some more empirical data on it as well. 
it varies like because of that sort of sense of fascination and terror uh, and sometimes in combination or sometimes in succession. Um, but that fascination and terror and that openness to a more complex sort of systemic way of looking at the world, uh, it has given rise to a lot of the transhumanist thought and transhumanist vision. And it's certainly, I mean, it's very, you know, microdosing is very, very popular in Silicon Valley. Psychedelics, you know, may be responsible for half the code that our machines run on. So you have that, but then on the other end of it, you have the psychedelic freak out, right? Like uh, where suddenly mm-hmm. these machines seem like monsters and the, the concept of a techno apocalypse uh, is, is right in your face. You can see it happening in, you know, before your eyes. I don't know what to make of it exactly. You know, like uh, Terrence McKenna who dropped, you know, everything that he could get his hands on. Uh, he he kind of saw both, right? He saw the destruction of the human race in this omega point that uh, Teilhard de Chardin described. And, uh, you know, he, he theorized that, you know, kind of like uh, the philosopher uh, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, you know, that there's this attractor at the end of history drawing us towards it. And that, that you know, psychedelics allow us to see our place in that, that stream of attraction and that the psychedelics give us some idea of what's at the end of that attraction. And one of the things that he, he, he described, or at least that he hypothesized, were that all of these UFO experiences, these gangly, awful-looking monstrous aliens in their, in their machines, are just our next step in being drawn down this you know, loop, down this spiral towards the great attractor at the end of history. So it's like both the horror and the fascination for him. He was all good with it. He thought this is great. Uh, it's just the way it's going to be, whatever. Get with it, people. But um, I wonder, now that psychedelics are becoming so normalized, uh, if it will shift the culture, it's sure to shift the culture both ways, but I wonder if it will have a predominant effect of making people that much more enamored with the digital and with the technological, or will it, uh, you know, maybe uh, inspire much more of a, a desire to return to nature and religious tradition? It is a really interesting point. I mean, I, for one, went in the latter direction where, you know, to me, it's like the whole purpose of psychedelics is to touch a sacred part of yourself to then inspire one to, you know, pursue a more spiritual path to, you know, basically self-realize. But I can, I certainly see a lot of people that are like treating them like an amusement park and escape. And I think my reality view is that consciousness, which we all are, has an innate desire to experience itself and expand. And what that means is, is that one must move to realization in one form or another, whether that's through spiritual means or, you know, perhaps there's these, this whole technical means thing. But what I find really interesting is that dependent upon the person and personality, people like myself, you know, have moved away from the kind of physicalist materialist view of the world to one that is more spiritually where the allegiance is, is more spiritual uh, with the recognition that, you know, there's a lot more everlasting love and joy and frankly, even intelligence there. But there's also this group of people that, have that taste and they're like, wow, like, did you hear about this device that you can shoot an ultrasound into your brain and be imported into a jhana state? Like, doesn't that sound better than becoming a meditator for a decade? And yeah, I I really don't know what to think of it. Like, I don't know how it's all going to shake out, but we have a front row seat to all of it. And um, it it should be pretty damn interesting. (laughs) Yeah, one way or the other, this 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 machine is going to keep rolling. Yeah, I, I think that there's it's very noble to want to stop it. I think that it's probably feasible to at least cut some of the funding from our own country. Whether or not that will leave us unable to compete with other countries is a really good question as well. But uh, you know, I I think that one way or the other, whether it's us, whether it's China, whether it's India, whether it's Israel, whether it's European nations, whether maybe even you know African and, and Latin American nations, you never know. Uh, but I think all of these uh, kind of technocratic and what we call transhumanist or however you want to call it, the biodigital conversions, whatever you want to call it, all of those are rocketing forward. 
because they mean more wealth, they mean more prosperity. In some sense, at least on the superficial level, it means more happiness. People dig it, they like it. Uh, And then most importantly, it means more power. So uh, nobody's going to stop. And yeah, we are definitely watching it unfold. I, I, I figure this way, really. At the end of the day, the one way I stay sane is just a a deep faith that that source, God, the depth, the soul within us, it can be enchanted by the external. It can be enchanted by the technological. Uh, And in that sense, it can be trapped for some time by the technological. But it cannot be eternally trapped by the technological by any stretch. Uh, And it really can't be touched by the technological. It's a faith. It's not something that, you know, there are a thousand reasons to doubt it. I don't. I just, I, you make the decision to believe and, yeah. and, and that's it. I'm in the same boat as you, man. And I believe in, and if we look at history and we look at even now, it's oftentimes because we're not able to, as paltry humans, as you put it, able to see the totality of things in a given moment, a lot of this stuff like the transhuman element movement, you know, may not make sense or may seem like a bad thing, but I just trust in the divine does have a plan that is aligned with love and that that is what we're moving towards. And and in a given moment, it's hard for us just to see the entire situation. And I just trust and have faith that, you know, everything is happening for a reason that is aligned with that. Well, Joe, this has been epic, man. I love talking to you. And everyone out there, if you're interested in this topic, um, Joe, I love your Substack. I wanted to give you an opportunity to plug that if that's the best place for people to follow your work. I know you're also on Steve Bannon. So um, yeah, where can people find you if they want to continue to learn from you? Uh, come check out the essays and articles at jobot.xyz. Just plug that in your URL. Uh, you can also follow me at my social media leash. Uh, you know, as long as I am leashed <laughs> to it, at J O E B O T X Y Z on there. Far too much. It's shameful. And then also, of course, check us out on the War Room with Steve Bannon. I'm one of the few apolitical commentators on there. So uh, come for the transhumanism and stay for the politics <laughs> nice all right everyone thanks so much for the listening if you like the show give it a star subscribe all those things we appreciate you and we'll see you on the next episode Bye.